Okay, hello everyone. First of all, I would like to acknowledge that we are on unceded Coast Salish territories. I am Sabina Bitter. I'm a faculty member of the visual art area here in the School for the Contemporary Arts. And I would like to welcome you all to this panel discussion with a quote from Antoni Muntadas. Right. Warning, perception requires involvement. This is part of his work on translation, and if you were here on Wednesday, Antoni showed a few terrific examples of possible translations or uh, different languages from his work. Antoni Montadas is our current artist in residence. Kirsten McAllister will introduce Montadas later. You hopefully all have seen already the exhibition downstairs entitled About Academia. The exhibition was realized in partnership with the Odin Gallery and as a few galleries director, Melanie O'Brien, who I would like to thank here, and thanks also to Brady Granfield, gallery assistant. About a year ago, I was really excited when Dana Agaidas from the Vancouver Art Gallery told us about his upcoming exhibition at the Vancouver Art Gallery and asked the question if we want to collaborate. About academia seemed to be the perfect fit with our mission of the Odin Residency Program and the Odin Gallery. Beside the exhibition, as I said, Antoni is our artist in residence here in the spring uh, 2013. But let me tell you really briefly about the residency program. As a collaborative effort to establish and continually develop the program from the visual art area, I'd like to thank first my colleagues, Jin Mi Yoon, Elspeth Pratt, Alison Clay, and Judy Radul, and also the director of the school, Owen Underhill, for his remarkable support. <coughs> The residents who already worked with us range from Maretica Potridge, Heavy Industries, Elke Krasny with Cecily Nicholson from the Downtown Eastside Women's Center, and last fall, um, the collective artist Claire Fontaine. The programs and engagement we work with our guests show a very big variety, always depending on the artist's uh, practice who we invite. This ranged from now from uh, tours through the city, workshops, film series, music performances, salons, to the production of works, studio visits with our students, and uh, academic seminar. The research-based practice of Antoni forms this kind of another way of engagement through his residency program. The project about the academia is an investigation into the relation between the university and academia. The work involves us in a set of questions and contradictions, which allows us to take a position for reflection. Muntadas worked on the project for over three years, and he emphasizes three main topics within the project, privatization, corporatization, and gentrification. And also, about academia has been located in and focused on the university system in the US. I think this project is really relevant and crucial for the context in Vancouver as well, especially if we think of the new loca location and the context of the School for the Contemporary Arts right here, named the Gold Cup Center for the Arts, located in the Woodwards Complex in Vancouver's downtown east side. As part of Antoni's residency, we will develop a publication to contextualize about academia within the unique social, political, and economic context of the university and academia here in Vancouver. This will be also a cooperation with uh, Line Books, West Coast Line Books. Personally, I have known Montada's work for decades. His presence in the art world is remarkable. Through a network of students, collaborators, and institutions, I really feel honored to work with you on this project, Anthony. I also would like to thank Alison Collins for working with us to set up this panel discussion, and wholeheartedly would like to thank all the participants who joined us on the panel. Geraldine Pratt, Ian Angus, Glenn Goldthard, and Serge Gipo, and uh, Kirsten McAllister. Kirsten will introduce the panelists, so I have the pleasure to introduce Kirsten before I hand over the panel to her. Kirsten McAllister is Associate Professor in the School of Communication here at SFU. Her research focuses on memory and political violence. Her publications include studies of how memories of World War II Japanese-Canadian internment camps circulate in the present, including the book Terrain of Memory, a Japanese-Canadian memorial project. She co-edited Locating Memory, Photographic Acts with Annette Kuhn and has published numerous articles and interviews on photography and memory, the cultural tactics of marginalized groups, as well as popular representations of displacement and loss. Kirsten is also the director of the Center for Policy Studies on Culture and Communities at SFU. 
Last year, I was pleased to be on a panel which Kirsten put together with Ender Profi, Catherine Murray, Colin Brown, entitled The Neoliberal University and Globalization a discussion on the fate or future of the arts, humanities, and social science as critical and creative forces. So this panel today, actually tonight, it continues an ongoing discussion. Many people also in the audience are deeply invested in these issues. Antoni mentioned a few times since he is here that everybody he needs uh, is permanently running, either late, can come, or, or comes earlier, or later, time scheduling, because they all have to teach. You mentioned that a few times. So it seems like uh, uh, this is a very specific reality of Vancouver, which I also don't know from other places, and I realize it also the last days, like everybody's always running around and has some strong uh, relationship to the university. And before I hand over to Kirsten, I would like to end with a quote from about academia, and uh, it's from an interview with Montadas and Ute Meta Bauer. And she says, there are turning points in our society, usually related to politics, and these are the moments when the divisions between academia and university becomes obvious. This is when you stand up for academic values versus the apparatus that hosts you which usually is related to the power that constitutes and finances this machinery. Thanks and enjoy the panel. And I will welcome Kirsten. Thanks so much, Sabine, for that introduction. I actually want to start by thanking Sabine for bringing Antoni Montadas to Simon Fraser University and setting up his residency at SFU Odane Gallery. It's an immense honor and opportunity to have Montadas at SFU's, as SFU's artist in residence here in Vancouver. Since Sabine has arrived in Vancouver at SFU, this is just one of many art projects she's instigated collaboratively, interfacing the landscapes of this city and, in fact, this region in, um, with critical and generative networks of artistic action in Europe, across the Americas, and into the economic south. So her collaboration here with Montaras is yet another project of experimental explore, exploration and revisioning of the spaces of production and potentiality here and across the rhizomic structures of power. So um, thank you, Sadine, for doing that and transforming the space here. So I'll begin by introducing uh, Antoni Montaras. He was born in Barcelona and lives and has worked in New York since 1971. His works um, have been in, exhibited in major art venues, such as the Venice Biennale, Documenta in Cassel, the Whitney Biennale, and museums ranging from the MoMA New York to the Museo Nacional Riana Sofia in Madrid. He is professor of the practice at ACT, uh, T, that's Art, Culture, and Technology, in the Department of Architecture at MIT, and he is a visiting professor at IUAV in Venice, Italy, and has also been teaching at numerous other institutions, including the San Francisco Art Institute and the Cooper Union in New York City. So um, we welcome you to present. Okay. Thank you. Um, I will do a very short uh, introduction of uh, why uh, the project Ac Academia starts. I feel like uh, having the, the installation downstairs, I will not describe what the installation and talk about, and actually I would like to slowly remove myself from this panel because I think that the importance of the panel is the debate that it could be about issues of university and academia. I think that when Sabine uh, contacted me in New York <clears throat> and after it was a conversation between Diana, Augaitis and Sabine about the possibility to do the, this work here in, in Vancouver, I was concerned than, than about contextualization. I was concerned that an issue of academia and university 
the American context is very different than Canadian, like it's very different from Europe. And I, my main concern was to see how we could present this work and also have a kind of debate. I always consider that the work that I'm doing tries to or pretends to be an artifact to activate discussion and thinking like that. The, the way of this uh, debate is, uh, for me, is I feel like i um, very grateful that you put together the, this panel for the possibility to discuss these issues. And in a way, I think it's uh, that, that your idea too. The, um, I think when you do a project, it's always private reasons or personal reasons and public reasons. And in the about academia, originally, the, my personal reason is that many years living and working, uh, working in uh, living not so much. I was kind of commuting to New York, but uh, working in, in MIT. And when I have the possibility by, by an invitation of Harvard to develop a project, I decided that it was a good occasion to analyze, explore the, a school town, Cambridge, where uh, Cambridge and MIT, other universities too, and where the debate there in an academic world is very, uh, very evident. Like that, the, the, I decided that the two universities that I could uh, provide by the people teaching there, a lot of uh, elements of information and, and, and experience. Like that, I start to do a series of interviews to people that are, for many years they've been working there. Uh, in the beginning, I concentrate in Cambridge, but then through the, the, the work, I think a project always starts in one way, but always evolves. Uh, I incorporate uh, the possibilities to interview other people in relationship with issues they start to extend. Now that the project is, is start as not only to explore issues of, of creation of knowledge, that I think is part of what the university is, but also I was interested to analyze the, the exercise of power by the people that are involved in academia. I think that part, uh, and interviewing people, I think the interview is one tool that I think is important. Sometimes we forget that, uh, of course, sociology, anthropology is the field uh, work, but uh, I think for me it was important to do these interviews to get some of the questions I have. The questions it was university versus academia, Values, private versus public, institution versus corporation, alumni, donors, and trustee as a network, space, city, and self-criticism. When I start to think about the space, the place where uh, the, the development of the university is, I start to think on architecture and I start to think about city planning, and I start to see, obviously, to issues of what in the university these days are very much from the, from the decision makers uh, are the word expansion. And expansion is connected with gentrification, and I think this is something that people talking with David Harvey, uh, Mark Wigley, and other people, it was really the last people I interview because I think the issues start to be strongly, apparently strongly. Anyway, I just was to, just to say that, uh, that it was kind of mixed between personal reason and public reasons. We know that the issues the university in uh, many parts of the world and I think the, the issues of private and public are there. I think in Canada is, uh, well, what I've been talking, uh, very different, but in a, no, a way it's a sharing also the, some preoccupation and some concern. That, that I will leave it there, and I think that, that 
I think it's five minutes. Yep, okay. sounds good, very good. I know we are concerned here that nobody exceeds on the five minutes. Yes, no? we hear you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank next, you. Thank you very much. Um, I'd, like next, I'd like to next introduce uh, Serge Guibault. Uh, he's a professor of art history at the University of British Columbia. His books include How New York Stole the Idea of Modern Art, Abstract Expressionism, Freedom and the Cold War. There's the book Voir ne pas voir, de voir, and also Los Esperimos de la Imagen uh, en Los Lindes de Siglo. <laughs> so please. So uh, <clears throat> thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting me too. Um, because I am, well, five minutes, I'm going to try to speak fast because I'm so old that, uh, you know, I, a lot of things to, I wanted to introduce. But um, uh, to be short, uh, I am kind of a, a strange bird because I, just like you, I, we are a strange bird too, but we were in the, another continent, right? So we were, we had to move. We moved from one place to another. So, and I moved from, from France to California for a PhD and then to Vancouver. And I could see the difference, the differences between the art world, but also of the, the universities. That was quite, to me, quite uh, interesting. The first time I, uh, so I, my career started, uh, I was a, uh, I was a long time ago, I was an artist, I was a photographer, then I was an art critic, then I was, I was writing criticism of uh, movies, cinema for newspaper in France, uh, then I, I worked in a museum, the Museum of Ecology and stuff like that. Um, and then I decided to move into uh, modern art, and it was very difficult to do this in France because the French teachers thought that modern art was not was not good enough, and it was, it was kind of, we had to wait 50 years in order to work on an artist, right? And so I got upset, so that's the, I think that I, now after all these years, I realized that one thread on my life is that I get upset. I get upset about everything, um, and I'm all, never, I'm very happy, but I'm never happy, you know, happy, like this. So um, I, I had to kind of, I had a fight with my prof, but he was very really understanding. So I got a grant, a Fulbright, I went to the States, and I came back with a text. And, and, and my prof said, you can work on American art, yes, but only if you, uh, if you talk, you analyze the influence of, French, of France on American art. So I said, okay, I didn't do it really, but anyway. So I, I went and I, I learned this. And I realized that, that the American university was, at UCLA in particular, was a lot more interesting than in France. I mean, I, lots of details, but I'm not going to go into this. But the, not only the, the technology was quite interesting, but also the way uh, profs were relating to students. That's, I thought, it was quite interesting. I was lucky because I arrived in the late 70s where uh, all kinds of uh, things were happening in the, in the field of art history. Um, and um, it, it, the field was exploding, right? So it was not anymore in the hands of connoisseurship. All kinds of questions were, uh, were asked to, about the material. So that was quite exciting and something that in France was impossible. And then when I came to, uh, to Vancouver, um, I was writing, uh, finishing this book, the, the, the book on New York, um, and I was impressed by two things. First of all, um, the, the way universities were built here, um, it was not like in France where universities in the middle of the city or in Bordeaux, right in the middle next to the fantastic bar New York, you know, where you go out of your class and you, with your prof, sometimes, few food prof, you can have a coffee and a beer. Uh, but here it was difficult. We were actually in a, a literally in a, in a tower, in an ivory tower, right? Uh, both of them. The city was wonderful in the middle, but on one side on the beach we have UBC, even Nude Beach, which to me was kind of surprising. But we are, we are on the beach, and the other one is on the mountain, right? So it was like an extraordinary kind of a situation. And what was interesting is that we were uh, protected, well, not protected, the city was protected from us intellectuals by a large forest. And I always thought, I always thought that was quite a, a kind of symbolically, it, uh, it meant a lot to me, and I realized uh, what the university was about. Uh, when we talked about um, to, to this, uh, com to this uh, meeting here, I thought there is an inst a very interesting book that uh, mentioned a lot of that and, and um, um, in the 1990s, I think it's called University in Ruins by Bill Readings. And, and a lot of uh, the discussion that we're starting here 
uh, has been touched a little bit in the 1990s because it seems like the, the, the world changed in the late 80s, right? The, I mean, the Western world, let's say, uh, with this kind of economic boom and a transformation and also disaster, but also the importance of uh, marketing and things like this. And uh, I just wanted to, to show what I mean by this because I have an example of, I'm sure you know it, but um, this is Art Forum now. When I start to read Art Forum, it was like this. All discussing interesting issues, theoretical issues, fights, very interesting. Now we have this. It, uh, I just weighed it today, and it's uh, almost two kilos, right? Four pounds of ads, right? <laughs> and so you, you have to fight your way through in order to, to find a text. Sometimes those texts are sharp. They are good, right? I mean, I'm not criticizing the, the content sometimes, sometimes, not always, but sometimes. But you have to go through all this, right? Obesity is not only in the normal public. It's also in those kind of things. So to me, this is a major danger. And um, the, this danger is not only in private and free enterprise art, articulation of, of reading. It's also in universities. And so maybe that's, that's what we are going to talk about, so I'll, I'll stop there. But the thing is, I'm always upset about something. Uh, that's true, that's, but not about today, not tonight. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, so next we have Geraldine Pratt. Uh, she's a professor of geography at the University of British Columbia. She is the author of Working Feminism and Families Apart, Migrant Mothers and the Conflicts of Labor and Love, and she's also the co-author of Gender, Work, and Space. Thank you, Kristen. Is that close enough? Yeah. Um, OK, so I am in the geography department at UBC, but I'm also um, the associate dean of faculty and equity in the Faculty of Arts. Um, when I began as associate dean two years ago, uh, I really love the fact that I was also the departmental faculty rep for the union, the faculty um, association, and in the dean's office. And um, there's something pleasurable and I think uh, actually quite important as well to hold our contradictions together, to actually embody them and, and, and really own them. Um, but then uh, the first year I was in the office, the faculty association didn't feel very comfortable holding that contradiction, not because of me, but more generally, and turf the, um, the associate deans out of the, the collective bargaining unit. So now I am solidly in management, really, in um, the belly of this beast that we're, we're talking about. Um, and in that context, I've been really interested to watch, uh, get a really uh, front row seat watching some of the shenanigans um, that go on in the um, central administration, but also um, to kind of think about the opportunities that exist to change the institution or, 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 or to at least hold it accountable in some way. Um, watching the university from the dean's office, uh, there are some very interesting contradictions, and I'll just mention two. On the one hand, um, at the moment at UBC, there's a huge investment in moving the university away from a flexible and casualized faculty labor force, which is quite unusual, I think. So ex at a significant cost to the university, sessional positions are being replaced uh, and made into permanent positions. But at the same time, um, um, the, the um, financial well-being of the university is increasingly contingent on attracting international students who pay differential fees. Um, so by 2020, it's projected that a third of the students at, in the Faculty of Arts will be paying international fees. That's a huge transformation in the university and really could be seen as a way of quasi-privatizing the public university. It's certainly going to change the class composition of our student body. Um, it'll be increasingly elite. Um, these global citizens are nevertheless going to have a particular class um, positioning. Um, we can see the internationalization of the university in the infrastructure of the university. Um, and rather than, uh, well, alongside gentrification, really, but I think 
Um, what's more apparent on the UBC campus out in the woods is the hospitalization of the campus. There's this construction, this kind of crazy construction right now of these clear, this clearly articulated network of arterial pedestrian pathways with these kind of great gushing fountains at the intersection. So um, unlike Hausman's Paris, I think um, I'm kind of hoping that this has less to do with the securitization or militarization of space than it has to do with recruiting international students and uh, ratcheting up UBC's ranking in the Shanghai Index and that kind of thing. Um, in terms of my research, much of my research for the last 16 or so years has been in collaboration with a number of Filipino-Canadian community organizations, in particular um, the Philippine uh, Women's Center of BC. Most of our research has been around, again, labor issues, um, in our case, temporary work migration. Um, the Philippine Women's Center has a very long history of working with academics. Um, they've thought very carefully about the progressive possibilities that emerge from that kind of alliance. And they've thought very carefully about the conditions under which um, that is more or less likely to happen. Um, so I've learned a great deal from them about um, how, to make, how to do that kind of solidarity work. Um, I've also um, been thinking about the university in community through my teaching. Um, I've taught this so-called community service learning course um, for the last six years um, through a research methods class. And, and because I've been in the dean's office, um, my PhD students and now postdoctoral teaching, uh, our teaching postdoc is, is carrying on. And, and we've put some really um, interesting collaborations, long, long-standing collaborations in place. So we've collaborated with Crabtree Corner um, in this neighborhood for the last six years. Um, doing research projects that they um, that are useful to they've found actually to be incredibly useful to them. Um, we have a different kind of collaboration going on in that class um, with Western Front and with um, some folks at SFU, Barry Truax, and some of his PhD students in the World uh, Soundscape Project. Um, so we've collaborated around making uh, and performing urban soundscapes at Western, but we perform them at Western Front once a year. So D.B. Boyker's been pretty enthusiastic about this collaboration as well. Um, but as Associate Dean, I, I've been a little skeptical about the way in which the university has um, kind of latched on to this notion of com community service uh, learning as a positive uh, good and, and um, what's I think particularly kind of troubling is as kind of evidence of the university's goodness. Um, and I'm also concerned about the fact that um, within my faculty, it's definitely women and racialized men who've taken on the labor of, of moving the university into different communities um, in, in, in sometimes very promising ways. Um, finally, um, what I'd add to these preliminary remarks is that I actually don't see the university as, as having a, a, a coherent set of values, and I think this is a really good thing. So what I do in the classroom, what I do as a researcher, is what a lot of my colleagues do, lots and lots of colleagues do. So for example, my colleague Sun, uh, Juanita Sunberg, also in geography, teaches a course on problematizing solidarity across global north and south, and she always says that in a in in collaboration with a community group from the Global South. And, and it's, it's a profound kind of collaboration in that class, which I'd be happy to talk about. But last year, um, the focus was on extracting the truth about Canadian mining in the Americas, um, which is, of course, an incredibly important issue for us to think about in um, our universities, because we have some, um, well, the reason why we're sitting here um, in this particular space is because of the generosity of the Canadian mining industry. Um, um, her values are my values, and I would really like to claim those as the university's values, my university's values. And I think there's a really important political point there. Um, we have to think about whose values we normalize when we talk about the university. Um, certainly, we have a, an really important role to critique the university. Um, but I think there's also some, uh, we have a really important role to bring into visibility the kinds of, of other kind of values and projects that are under play there. And if we keep telling the same old stories, narrat narrativizing the kind of the neoliberal corporate university in the same old ways, I think we're not fulfilling that kind of second strand of telling alternative narratives about the values that are already in play in our universities. 
Thanks very much. Um, next, we'll have Glenn Cohart. He's an assistant professor in the First Nations Studies Program um, and the Department of Political Science at the University of British Columbia. His most recent work on Franz Fanon and the politics of recognition won the Contemporary Political Theories Annual Award for the best article of the year. He is Yellow Knives Dene. Thank you. Um, first, I'd like to also acknowledge that we are in unceded uh, traditional territories and occupied territories of the Coast Salish peoples. I'd also like to give a nod out to the more than 100, I think it was 133 cities across the globe where Indigenous peoples and their supporters took to the streets today um, to express their um, resistance and refusal to ongoing colonial rule um, in Canada and elsewhere um, under the banner Idol No More. Um, I'm not an administrator. I teach. I write some stuff. And I'm just going to kind of uh, run through um, some of the research that I do. And I'll leave it for the conversation afterwards to kind of place it in the context of uh, the power relations of universities um, and, and the alternative practices that I engage in pedagogically as a, as a teacher and educator. So my research engages a multiplicity of diverse anti-colonial traditions and practices uh, to challenge uh, the increasingly commonplace idea that the settler colonial relationship between indigenous peoples and the Canadian state can be adequately transformed by a politics of recognition. So this requires two definitions, what I mean by settler colonialism and what I mean by politics of recognition. A settler colonial relationship is one that is characterized by ongoing domination. It is a relationship where power, in this case interrelated material and non-material facets of economic, gendered, racial and state power, has been structured into a relatively secure and immobile set of hierarchical social relationships that continue to facilitate the dispossession of indigenous peoples of our lands and of our self-determining authority. In this respect, Canada is no different than any other settler colonial power. In the Canadian context, colonial domination continues to be structurally oriented around the state's commitment to maintain, through force, fraud, and more recently so-called negotiations over land and self-government, the ongoing access to the land and resources that contradictorily provide the material and spiritual sustenance of our societies on the one hand, and the foundation of colonial state formation, settlement, and capitalist development on the other. I take politics of recognition to refer to the now expansive range of recognition-based models of liberal pluralism that seek to reconcile indigenous assertions of nationhood with settler state sovereignty via the accommodation of indigenous identity claims in some form of renewed legal and political relationship with the state. Although these models tend to vary in both theory and praxis, most call for the delegation of land, capital, and political power from the state to indigenous peoples through a combination of land claim settlements, economic development initiatives, and self-government agreements. Contra the emancipatory claims of the politics of recognition, my research demonstrates that instead of ushering in an era of peaceful coexistence grounded on the idea of mutual recognition or equality between peoples, the politics of recognition in its contemporary form uh, promises to reproduce the very configurations of colonialist, racist, patriarchal power that indigenous peoples' struggles for recognition have always rendered problematic. So to demonstrate this claim, my work, uh, I theoretically and empirically map the contours of what I consider to be a, decisive, a de or decisive shift in the operation of colonial power following the recognition or the uh, emergence of the recognition paradigm following the release of the federal government's infamous white paper in 1969. In the two centuries leading to this, this, uh, this historic policy proposal, which essentially called for the blanket uh, assimilation of the status Indian population by unilaterally removing all institutionally enshrined aspects of legal and political differentiation that, uh, that, differ, or that differed uh, from us from Canadians, 
the reproduction of the colonial relationship between indigenous peoples um, was geared around genocidal practices of forced exclusion and marginalization. It was overt. Any cursory examination into the character of Canadian Indian policy during this period will attest to this fact. For example, this era witnessed Canada's repeated attempts to uproot and destroy the autonomy of our modes of life through institutions such as the residential schools, through the imposition of settler state policies aimed at explicitly undercutting indigenous political economies and relations to and with land, through the violent dispossession of First Nations women's rights to land and community membership under sexist provisions of the Indian Act, through the theft of Aboriginal children via racist child welfare policies, and through the near wholesale dispossession of Indigenous peoples' territories and modes of traditional governance in exchange for delegated administrative powers to be exercised over relatively minuscule reserve lands. All of these policies sought to marginalize Indigenous peoples and communities with the ultimate goal being our elimination. If not physically, then as cultural, political, and legal peoples distinguishable from the rest of Canadian society. These initiatives reflect the more or less unconcealed, unilateral, and coercive nature of colonial rule during most of the 19th and 20th centuries. So to get at precisely how colonial rule made this transition from a more or less unconcealed structure of domination to a mode of colonial governmentality that works through the limited freedoms afforded by state recognition and accommodation, my work significantly but not exclusively relies on or engages with the work of anti-colonial theorist, psychiatrist, and revolutionary France Fanon. Black Skin, White Masks, for example, offers a groundbreaking critical analysis of the affirmative relationship drawn between recognition and freedom in the master-slave dialectic of Hegel's phenomenology of spirit, a critique which I claim is equally applicable to contemporary liberal recognition-based approaches to indigenous self-determination in Canada. Fanon's analysis suggests that in contexts where colonial hegemony requires uh, the produ or, um, in contexts where um, the colonial relationship is not reproduced through force or violence alone, the maintenance of settler state hegemony requires the production of what he liked to call colonized subjects, namely the production of the specific modes of thought, colonial thought, desire, and behavior, which implicitly or explicitly commit the colonized to the types of practices and subject positions that are required for our ongoing domination. However, unlike the liberalized appropriation of Hegel that continues to inform many contemporary theorists of identity politics, in Fanon, recognition is not posited as a source of freedom for the colonized, but rather as the field of power through which colonial relationships are maintained and upheld. This is the form of recognition, Fanon writes, that Hegel never described. And this is the form of recognition that I seek to interrogate in my own work when looking at uh, Canadian Indian policy post-1969. Masi Joe. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, it'll be uh, really uh, interesting to hear you talk more later on, as you said, about um, doing that work within the institution and some of the transformations at UBC and the possibilities and also the challenges of that. Um, we next have Ian Angus. Uh, Ian Angus is the Professor of Humanities at Simon Fraser University. His recent books include Identity and Justice, and there's also the book Love the Questions, University Education and Enlightenment. Um, thanks very much to Sabine Bitter and the other organizers for asking me to contribute today. Um, I just noticed about uh, the beginning of this panel that I've lost the last page or possibly 15 or 20 pages, I, I don't know, of, the, of what I had to say. So I'm going to have to improvise an ending, which may be sudden. Uh, my, my remarks are based uh, on, uh, uh, I've given the title, Restless Subjectivity and the Question of the University. The university has come into question. The social role of the university has so changed within the last three decades that those within it and many outside it have been forced to wonder what it has become and what of its future may be discerned or created. What was the university? Each social form contains a desire for knowledge that is appropriate to that social form 
and concentrates that desire in a certain institution. Ancient Greek society produced philosophical schools, feudal society produced monasteries, tribal societies institutionalized the wisdom of elders. The modern university is the concentrated site of the desire for scientific knowledge and the consequent necessity to educate students into its practice. Since the founding of the University of Berlin in 1810 and the subsequent near universal spread of its model, the interpenetration of research and teaching within a scientific paradigm has defined the purpose of the university. Moreover, the state has played a crucial role from the beginning in regulating, as well as often funding, modern universities. Research and the induction of students into the activity of research is oriented to discovery. Discovery supposes that a significant piece of knowledge is as yet unknown. The modern university thus proceeds from what is already known towards what is not yet known. Ideally, in the scientific mode, what becomes known can be fitted smoothly into what is already known so that the process of searching for new knowledge can be continuously repeated. The university not only tolerates but requires this uncertainty, that the total available knowledge is not sufficient. A certain restlessness that requires living with uncertainty thus inhabits the process of scientific research and structures inquiry in the modern university. In its more recent incarnation after the Second World War, another task was layered over the scientific paradigm, the creation of an educated citizenry. Democracy, which we may define quickly as the active participation in citizenship by the greatest possible number, was taken to require widespread higher education, both because we live in a technological bureaucratic society that requires some sophistication to understand and evaluate, but also because individual advancement was seen as part of the democratic promise. The compromise between these three goals was the basis for the growth of higher education in the second half of the 20th century. Scientific research, citizenship, and individual advancement. The dismantling of the welfare state in more recent years has pulled apart this compromise and made it unclear at what goals the university is now supposed to aim. During the era of this compromise, the uncertainty that inhabits scientific research was brought into relation with another deeper uncertainty that I want to call restless subjectivity. The citizenship role of the university meant that not only science, but also the circulation of social meaning became important to higher education. University education involved the induction, understanding, and criticism of social meaning, and therefore needed to expand from a simply scientific model of knowledge to one including social cohesion and participation. This brought traditionally humanistic forms of knowledge closer to the core goals of the modern university. Uncertainty was no longer confined to the process of scientific research aiming to terminate in new knowledge, but expanded to the restless subjectivity that inhabits the circulation of social meaning. Thus, the arts and humanities, in their tr traditional defense of restless subjectivity through personal quest, not expected to become completed in solid knowledge, moved towards the center of higher education. The current questioning is provoked by a global capitalist order in which state regulation and funding has decreased drastically, such that the university's role in the circulation of social meaning is shrinking to the production of profit in a manner comparable to that uh, which science and technology, to which science and technology long ago submitted. Education is amputated to become training. When I say restless subjectivity, I'm thinking of Hegel's unhappy consciousness, the existential necessity to create meaning, Marx's theory of alienation, the artistic search indicated by Rainer Maria Rilke's phrase that, quote, a creator must be a world for himself, and so on. Restless subjectivity is more at home in the arts and humanities because the texts on which these disciplines focus are creative, in quotes, in the sense that they express the subjectivity of the writer or, in more contemporary terms, deploy a linguistic imagistic usage which constructs a singular textual formation. Restless subjectivity may dream of a resolution, a coming home towards uncomplicated belonging, but it is itself constructed such that this could never be its own achievement. It re in this, it remains distinct from scientific research. Even past achievement does not count as def definite knowledge. By restless subjectivity, I mean a subjectivity that aims in the first place at a singular textual formation rather than an intersubjectively shared acquisition, where any given singular text produced will be inadequate to the continued questioning undertaken by that subjectivity. Of course, 
such a singular expression can later begin to affect the social and shared world. Such a movement from restless subjectivity through singular text towards intersubjective affectivity is characteristic of the arts and humanities. I won't try to define subjectivity itself, other than to say that it shouldn't be thought of in an ontological sense as person or individual, but rather in terms of a difference or non-identity produced by the intersection of circuits of communication. The restlessness of such a subjectivity becomes a source in the sense of an origination within its field for new interactions not reducible to prior circuits. Yeah, okay, so in the past, <laughs> the coffee shop, the street corner, the living room of a private home provided different sites in different places and times for creative expression. This site changes in relationship to the possibilities within the, so the social field, the possibilities that are both created and excluded by these surrounding social and economic forces. The question of the university today is about the extent to which it can remain a site that harbors restless subjectivity, the extent to which it can prevail in, 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 uh, in, in, in becoming, remaining a site or becoming and remaining a site for restless subjectivity while the forces of the state and the economy shift. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. So as all of you were speaking, I was thinking about the ways in which, um, again, this key theme of the university's transformation. And um, there's a lot of hope in um, what many of you addressed in your presentations. So um, I'm wondering if you could, in, in different ways, Geraldine, for example, you talked about UBC. And I'm wondering if the other panelists could talk specifically about Vancouver, UBC, Simon Fraser. And I want to draw out especially what Geraldine was saying um, about the contradictions and what it's like to be um, in the university producing in this very contradictory space of corporatization, gentrification, um, occupation. And um, so one of the, the questions um, that, um, Antoni, uh, you had mentioned that you were interested in especially was the alternative. Because it, the, neo, the critique of the neoliberal university in some ways has become an industry and uh, the effect of that industry um, has to be taken up by other means. So, um, Serge, you talked about your own um, work inside and outside of the university and your own observations about the ways in which the universities, in fact, are at one, e either end of the city, outside in this ivory tower. So I wonder if each of you could address specifically um, that contradictory place of being. And um, Glenn, especially uh, with the work uh, that you've done and with the possibilities at UBC, given that it's uh, the territory on which UBC is located, um, there's a lot of interesting contradictions and possibilities. So in terms of alternative models, if each of you could just take up that theme um, in a little more detail, uh, starting with uh, Serge. Thank you. Thanks. Um, well, I, I, what is interesting to me is that the, uh, it, it's possible to see the transformation of university over the last 20 years or 20, 25 years. Um, when I first arrived here, I thought it was kind of the atmosphere was quite interesting in my department. Um, art historians were kind of uh, um, made fun of, you know, often because we don't, they don't, we, the society doesn't really need us, you know, we just, uh, that was the kind of the feeling, unless we were connoisseur to, to write text for the marketplace, right? I mean, of course, but if you are interested in something else, we were in between things, to the point that Mr. Anthony, that when you did this show in the Cap in Mordeaux, uh, you, you say, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interview all kinds of people. And you have a list of very interesting people. There's not art critics, uh, sociologists, and so on. There's not an art historian. So I'm very happy that this year you kind of uh, saw the bright light, <laughs> right? And so because, because I think art historians, actually the way I understand art historians, 
are kind of um, uh, interesting because they are they, they are kind of a part of the discourse of power and and all that on all that things right through images which is images are now the most important things in our culture so uh, to be able to deconstruct all this is quite is quite crucial but when I arrived here I was saying that is it, to do this job of job, the construction is more and more complicated now, it seems to me. But when I arrived, I arrived in the department uh, run by uh, the, the head was a, a guy called George Knox, and he had this very good idea to have, uh, you know, the our field in artistry is divided in, in centuries, you know, like uh, the Greek, Roman, the medieval, and you mean until, not today, but until yesterday, right? And, um, but he had uh, two profs in each field, two profs. One on the right and one on the left. And that was, to me, that's quite, quite uh, amazing um, because right away when I arrived, we start fighting, right? Uh, alliances, but fight, but not very nicely because we had a lot of parties, so we, we kind of good friends. But at the same time, the issues that we were debating was quite interesting, and the students understood what we used to say, what is at stake in the production of artistry of those texts or analysis of images and situations and so on. And this, all, over the years, that disintegrated very quickly. And you could see that uh, after that, after 10 years of that kind of system, it was gone. When I arrived also, uh, I was surprised and impressed by Canadian institutions because the, when I came in and I had all kinds of funny ideas, I want to do funny things and so on. And in France, when I was proposing those things, the French position is always, oh, very interesting, but it's too complicated. Or we don't have time, or you are not old enough, you know, all kinds of stuff like this. When I came here, the first reaction of the dean's office, for example, was, oh, great, how can we help you? This, I'm sorry, uh, this has disappeared, really, because we, is not the, the individual, the individual has not, um, the possibility to do this anymore. Now we have to be, like in cooperation, we have to be a team. We have to be like at attached to the project like a bunch of horses, you know, to pull the damn thing uh, and to make money. You have to kind of find the money yourself sometimes and so on and so forth. So the atmosphere is very, very, very different. But the university still thinks that group work is good. So we tried to, in several years ago, I forgot how many years now, but we had this idea of uh, interdisciplinary, this, this interdisciplinarity, lots of debate at UBC about that, what it meant, how it works, and so on. But often it didn't really work because uh, what the administration does not understand is that if you do a project and uh, you have to have a certain amount of uh, uh, commune you know, feeling or, or understanding, uh, you cannot mix because you work on the, I don't know, 19th century culture that you bring whoever in because it's the 19th century, it's, you end up in a nightmare, right? There's, nobody understands each other and so on. So, so that, that, that kind of thing, that's what he talks about in the ruins of the university, is that even if the ideas are, are good, the feelings are good, it doesn't, it doesn't really work anymore, it seems to me, uh, to, um, to make a, a, a radical critique. That's what I was thinking before. Uh, like uh, Paul Virilio says something very interesting. He says, as a philosopher, he's always against everything. That's very important to be against everything because you know that the thing that you are confronted with, with is always trying to invent, to, to control you and to, com to manipulate you, right? The ideology, right? So the role of a prof, it seems to me, and is not always kind of uh, helped by the administration, is to be against everything and to be a pain in the neck, yes, sometimes. And the students kind of uh, should learn that, that, that they, are, they have, a, they have a, a space to interrogate, to discuss, to contradict. That's quite very, very important, and there is no structure. You, in the university now, you really have to fit uh, in, some, in some of those, uh, I would call, cells that are in, the, in, in campus, right? Uh, they are, we have become like um, little, I don't know, underground groups. So the people are, you know, they, are, they kind of work in their, in their corners, and there is, no, there is no real place, it seems to me now, for uh, the type of discussion that I'm always interested in um, because of this professionalization as well. Um, and your question was about? That's, uh, that's, I'm sorry, I, yeah, I, I know, I know. That's perfect. I think you've really pointed out the, the way in which subjects and spaces have been disciplined to the point of, um, even to the point where 
criticism itself is now professionalized. And we have very compliant types of criticism. Yes, but if, can I add a little thing? Because what is interesting in our field, in art history and art criticism, right? Um, I remember in the 1980s, the world changed because the, the world of art criticism, for example, collapsed, right? It was like uh, the market was talking, taking over already. And I remember friends of mine, we had, we had fights and discussions like this with friends of mine, like uh, Al Foster, Buclo, I don't know if you know those people. But they were art critics. And we had this fight in Vancouver in a, in a conference that we organized. And I was telling, telling them that the university actually was interesting because we were in an ivory tower. We were outside. And uh, we, were, we were able to say whatever we wanted. I mean, we, it was not under McCarthy. So it was a place of experimentation, of excitement, and so on and so forth. And art critics, they were you know, in cohoot with the market. And so we had those debates all the time. And finally, what did they do? By the end of the 80s, both of them, and three, I think there were three or four of them, they went to art history to have a PhD. And now, though, they, are, they have been able to make a critique of their own world, of the, of the art criticism stuff, uh, but still interested in contemporary culture. That was, that was their thing, their field. And they managed to produce a book that we can disagree, but a book that now is, is uh, used by undergraduate students all around the country, including in Canada, about art history, right? their view of art history. And some people criticize them because they are too strict, you know, they, they have a certain vision, and they, but they argue for it. And I think it's interesting. So what we, what we should have now, for example, is an alternative to this, to have a confrontation between those two types of, two, two type of position of how you see culture working in, uh, in, in our world. Uh, so that was kind of a, uh, now they are teaching, though. They are teaching in university. And now they are not that happy anymore about the environment in which they are. They are also at Harvard. They are at Columbia. Uh, there is something that is not, still not working. So basically, they are still not happy, which I think is quite good. Mm -hmm. ah, sure. Okay, unhappiness. We'll embrace that then. <laughs> uh, Geraldine, um, would you like to follow up in any way? I'm also always thinking about... Okay. Um, <laughs> Especially with no, 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 not no, not that. We're not asking that. Um, um, one of the issues about having this talk in this event here is around the gentrification, and we were discussing earlier the way in which UBC's model of expansion um, is quite different than the model here in terms of gentrification and the university. So, as a geographer, I'm wondering. Yeah, well, well, could, Glenn, actually, I'm kind of keen to hear about what you're doing. In your all teaching right. and yeah. All right, all and right. That, but also, <laughs> yeah. you had some good ideas about gentrification too. Yeah. Um, all right. So we'll go to so Glenn. I can, uh, <laughs> Very orderly. I'll try and make uh, what I said here relevant to the university. So, if you think of um, if you think of instead of the colonial kind of foundation of the state, and then you now focus more narrowly on the colonial foundation of educational institutions and in, in reproducing this mess that we're in um, through residential schools and these sorts of things, I think um, that problem, the colonial character, um, its exclusions, its role in genocide and so on from educational institutions, um, has been responded over the last uh, 30 or so years in the same way um, um, that I speak of in relationship to the state. So it's been an, um, emerging a demand um, that that history and its traces that still structure the university in the present um, has been uh, put to account through a demand for recognition. So it's a recognition of more Aboriginal programming. It's a recognition of more Aboriginal bodies. Um, it's a recognition um, or a demand for recognition that um, different modalities of thought be incorporated and inform uh, the institution of universities. Now, my concern is, is that, on the one hand, that serves to um, let the university off the hook in relationship to the critiques of its ongoing coloniality and practices of racist exclusion and marginalization, so you, you offer a gesture of recognition by saying, well, we've now included you, but we've included you under very uh, constrained, um, uh, in a very constrained form of recognition that doesn't actually go about um, 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 restructuring the power imbalances that are kind of um, core to it. 
Um, so it left the institutional sort of thing um, off the hook. But my concern is is that um, when you when you are entering into kind of the institutional and discursive kind of uh, formation of the university with the with the uh, with the hope or assumption that you're going to enter into it with your bodies and your own kind of modalities of thought and pedagogical sort of that um, you're in two, you're in a war with uh, two profoundly asymmetrical um, um, knowledge power sort mm -hmm. of conflict. So the concern is that integrative approach to attempt to incorporate, for example, indigenous knowledge in the community is more likely going to transform those indigenous knowledges in ways that does um, ontological or epistemic violence to them. So I actually think that uh, that there it's a very risky game as the the politics of recognition in in relationship to the state is a very risky game for the subjects who are engaging in that i e indigenous peoples however um, that politics of recognition has enabled me as a professor and an educator to um, to enter into this game and to carve out spaces of autonomy, which I think are important uh, for community members and students as well. So I don't want to totally discredit it. Uh, but for like both discursive and institutional um, sort of transformations, I would, I would, um, and I have looked elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So, so um, establishing. Um, um, uh, sites and programs that are more appropriate to the types of knowledge and education that I want to be a part of. Um, so I, I helped establish or, or help work with this program. Um, it's an accredited and a host of problems with that accredited program where we, uh, where we re embed indigenous and non indigenous students in the social relations that are embodied by indigenous and particularly in my case, Dene notions of land. So the land-based practices and forms of knowledge um, that we use and articulate in our critique of power institutions, economy, um, so on. That cannot happen in a university. Mm. That has to, that's an embodied sort of pra like practice-based pedagogy which has to be in relationship to community, um, ex uh, expertise that are appropriate to that knowledge in relationship to the land. And even in kind of trying to get this programming and this, these forms of knowledge and research acknowledged by the university, um, you all of a sudden have to go through a number of hoops that, that um, really compromise what you're attempting, attempting to do. It's like, well, what are you, what are you reading? Uh, what, are you, what are the students writing? And these sorts of things when, when uh, we're trying to do something um, far more profound and different. So there's a lot of surveillance by the sounds of it. Um, in the activities you're partaking in? Well, it's, it's strange because there's on the one hand a demand for recognition that these are valid forms of knowledge and, and approaches, um, but there's also an inca an inca like a structural incapacity to be able to recognize what the hell you're yeah. doing. Um, yeah. Um, so then, then it's a, like yeah. we have to lock in on this and retranslate it into, yeah. well, grades and papers and these sorts of things, which does violence to what the, mm -hmm. the type of education uh, that we're trying to, to uh, facilitate. So. Okay. Maybe there's something really positive about the idea of the university in ruins that we kind of leave it as this shell as, because that, that kind of moving sideways or going elsewhere, I think there's actually a lot of potential to just take your stuff out, like, like my, my friend Juanita Sundberg, they do their class presentations at the Rise Home Cafe, or, you know, it's a public space, and so, or, or in terms of the, um, this research methods class, you, you, you know, your research is in, is, it, you've left the university in a certain way, although it provides a structure, but, um, you know, I wonder, I mean, maybe you just move sideways. Sometimes you just move sideways, and that's the most progress. The you know, you, you move to another space. But I, I'm interested in thinking about how, and maybe you just can't. You can't come bring what you do back to transform the university. But I'm not quite willing to. You don't think there's ways of. Again, it's just being like vigilant in the risks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is my point more. I'm not going to abandon 
um, the, like demanding that indigenous knowledges and, and kind of practices be recognized as legitimate uh, forms within an institutional setting like a university. But I'm also going to be very cognizant of, of the risks associated with with that attempt to interpolate a much pow more powerful um, um, f field, both institutionally and discursively, um, because the end effect might be our interpolation yeah, into yeah, yeah, totally. um, into that that apparatus. And, and yet, so, but there are some interesting examples. So, in terms of the kind of what I deal with um, um, in the dean's office is faculty kind of promotions and all of that stuff. And so I'm, I'm, I'm kind of um, really interested in the research protocols that the university has developed with Musqueam peoples. And you, you know, there is, you, you can't make some of the research public, right? It's just like that's part of it. And it's like, it's hilarious actually to sit and I've, I've, I've had to go in and kind of present cases to the senior appointments committee and they go, uh, you, they, you, you can't publish publicly. It's like, no, that would violate the university policy. And it's like, and there's this kind of, what? But the university is shifting. I mean, it has to. There's a protocol in place. And so it's a really interesting moment where the university has shifted. They can't, I mean, the audience there has shifted totally of who the knowledge is being produced for and, and how. So... Yeah. That's an interesting point, but um, and I would say or stress this point coming from the side of the researcher. That's a relationship between a community and an institution, which has been making ethically some breakthroughs in terms of the dissemination of knowledge, what can and can't be published. But um, um, but me going up for tenure. Uh, under those arrangements, where it's like, well, actually, this was a community-based project which have these restrictions on dissemination and so on. Um, that, the university has been very stubborn in being able to accommodate um, for indigenous faculty and researchers. So we're still, mm -hmm. like, held accountable to a very certain understanding of knowledge production and dissemination, publication, and so on. Um, which just means that it's a double burden, which I'm fine with. You, I have to be able to do what you all do and, at, like, and be competitive at that, but I also have to be able to have my uh, feet grounded in different systems um, in order to maintain the integrity of being a Native um, community member and scholar in the university. So. Yeah, and UBC is a really interesting case in particular, but I wonder if we can um, shift to you, um, Ian, we'll come back to the, the points and the issues you've raised, especially around this restless subjectivity that you've raised. And um, in terms of SFU, trying to, to, uh, and the work you've done, um, if you could address how that might take form, and also the disturbances it causes around this, uh, these discipline subjects, capital, and um, the structures of power. Yeah, well, thanks for the previous discussion because it reminded me what was on my last page. Yeah. Uh, uh, I did want to end not just with about uh, how everything is going to the dogs because of neoliberalism. Um, I, did, I wanted to end on the note that we're actually, I think, living in a time in which there's a contradiction between a reorganization of things uh, in, uh, in a, a kind of less hierarchical but more uh, uh, horizontally market-based form of, uh, of domination due to neoliberalism. And I do think it's an important thing to understand that well. But uh, that's going on at the same time as you've got all sorts of forms of emergent self-organization going on. And that's true, I think, more generally. But it's that, that being the environment, that's restructuring the university. And in particular, it's having the effect of restructuring the, restructuring the boundary between the university and the, the surrounding community. And I think that means that a number of things to, to, uh, are, are mean different things now than they did a few years ago. So it would seem to me that one thing, for example, I would want to do, and here I think I'm agreeing with Serge, um, uh, this, the defense of traditional scholarship is an important thing to do nowadays. And it's not so traditional to do that because it allows, for one thing, the autonomy of the researcher to choose his or her own problems, which is uh, in the middle of a climate which is pushing you towards 
applicable work applicable to the community, and we know who the community are. It's not you and me, it's the corporate community. So the fact if you can stand on your traditional, to the extent to which you can stand on your traditional academic rights to choose your own problems, you've got a little space to move there, I think, and I think that's important. Then the, the other problem is how to, how to involve, uh, which you've been talking about, right, how to involve yourself with forms of emergent or, or indeed persistent self-organization um, that, that exist without, outside the university and to engage with it in dif different and new ways. And that requires a lot of creative thinking, obviously, uh, which you're obviously engaged in. So I, I think there's a, a shift going on. Now, how does it pertain to, uh, to SFU? Well, uh, I can't sort of invent a complete analysis of SFU and off the cuff, but I mean the most important thing that this has happened. Uh, you, you referred to in your opening remarks uh, the, the Gold Corp uh, uh, donation of ten million dollars um, uh, for the finishing of this building and for for various community uh, um, programs, let's say, uh, and the controversial nature of those programs in the downtown east side, which surrounds this, this institution, is the biggest thing, I think, that has happened to SFU along these lines in a long time. Um, and, and, it's, it, and it means a number of things which are hard to, you know, hard to all deal with all at once. But, um, but, so I'll say it really quickly and directly. The Canadian... Canada is a haven for international mining companies. 70% um, of the mining companies in the world are registered in Canada because Canada has the most uh, 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 friendly regime to, to, to uh, the production of uh, sur surplus value, if you like, or profit, if you like, uh, from that sector. So the reason for this is uh, the, 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 the government we've had and the, and the history we've had in the, uh, of resource extraction in this country for many time, years. So the whole country is becoming a one-company town, basically. Now, why do they give money to institutions like this? Because of the, 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 the fact that so many of these companies are based here in Canada and that this is the, re, the public regime that governs them around the world, whether they started in Canada or not, Chile or wherever they started out being based, it's important that the Canadian public be kept ignorant, right? Every once in a while, there's a bit of a, there's a, bit of a, a, a development of some thought about this matter and what it means. Now, that is bad from their point of view. So giving money to public institutions like the universities is a way of proving that they are good corporate citizens. They come in if you ask them to talk. They talk for endlessly, uh, really endlessly, about corporate, corporate social responsibility and things like this. And if you say things that, uh, as some of the graduate students in a group opposing this at SFU did, if you say things uh, that, uh, that talk about the actual uh, cruel practices uh, that they, they are practicing in other parts of the world, um, they threaten to sue you, and they try to shut you down with slap suits. So the role of SFU in this is that we are one part of a larger reorganization of things that's going on in the country in which universities are being pushed towards the side of being whitewashers of cruel practices which are destroying people's lives and destroying the environment around the world. We have to wake up to this situation, and that's why I think talking about the structure of neoliberalism and how it works is a very important thing to do, and it's by no means passe. On the other hand, to talk about it just in such a way as it seems that we're all victims and so on, there's nothing we can do about it, that's a problem too. So this brings a number of things into, uh, in, into, into a new formation. One of those things is many of the people who are suffering from these things, both in Canada and in other places in the world, are Aboriginal people. Uh, so where there's a new kind of connection, I think, possible only possible, not for sure by any means, but possible between the Canadian public and the traditional demands and the new demands of, of, of Aboriginal people. And we're seeing some of that on the streets now, of an increasing disillusionment with the kind of government that we've had for a long time here. And what's the role of the university in this? We have to struggle all we can to against that, that, that structural, structural ignorance. Uh, because we have to try to play our roles as world citizens, uh, and there's a big task, big, big task, which I, I know many people here and, and at our university and at other universities and across the country are doing their damnedest to play, do a bit for. Uh, 
that's what I. Okay. Thanks very much. Um, I'd like to now open up the discussion to the floor. So in doing this, um, I'd like to just go over some of the key thematics in the work and the discussions that uh, we've had at, uh, on this panel right now. So again, there's the thematic academia university, the bodies of people and thought versus the bureaucratic structure. There's values and power. The other set of thematics are public, private. There's alumni, donors, trustees. There's institution, corporation. Then there's three sets of themes, space, city, self-criticism. And in particular, uh, what's happening here in Vancouver um, on this, on the, on this, as uh, Glenn said, unceded territory um, and the possibilities that, that are happening at our universities, as well as some of the really frightening um, developments. Uh, I know there's a lot of knowledge in the room, there's a lot of experience in the room, so um, if I, I encourage all of you and I welcome all of you to um, either stand up and make a point or ask a question, and I will ask our panelists to address those questions and points. Uh, this, is a, this is a great opportunity that um, Antonio Montunas Mon Mon Montanas has offered us in, to come together and to engage around these issues in, in, in these, around these formulations. Uh, when you do speak, please put up your hand and uh, introduce yourselves to us. I believe there's a mic. Uh, so I'll stand up so I can see because I can't see anyone. So, um, yes. Oh, I don't think this is working. I won't use this one. <laughs> so please introduce. Yes, my name is Mohamed Salemi. I'm an independent curator who lives in Vancouver. Uh, my first question had to do with like another category that could be discussed, and that's the category of digitization and how the category of digital is, is sort of like making a huge impact on the way educational system, particularly humanities, are sort of like moving into this changing world and particularly digital humanities and how this is going to sort of like fit into the new liberal model and how much resistance or how much room does it offer for, for working with it and how much it's sort of like risky and dangerous. And then the other, the other thing that I think it's important to address is, and there was a major New York Times article about it about a few weeks ago, it was like eight or nine pages, very deep sociological research about how Education America that traditionally used to be like a, like a field in which class difference could be leveled, now it's actually used or it's being used to, to further divide classes through student loan and how with like the shortage of funding, how students who come from background that can't afford things, they come in and they end up lower than where they were after the degree. So it's like schools are actually creating more class division rather than helping. So I thought maybe we can discuss these two. Yep. Thank, thanks very much. Uh, panelists, um, if, you could, um, if you'd like to address some of these questions uh, around digital technology, the form of knowledge and relationship to neoliberalism, and the ways in which universities now actually increase um, that class divide. How is that, what does that look like on the ground here um, or in comparison to elsewhere? Thoughts? Yeah, thanks. Well, uh about this digitization of the humanities thing, uh, that, this is interesting me a lot these days. And, and it, it seems to mean uh, two, at least two different things. Uh, one of the things that when, when you do the searches, right, and you see what people mean by the digitization of humanities, it essentially means applying digital means to the humanities. So that, you know, it's now easy to know how many times uh, Shakespeare said... Uh, whoremonger or something like that uh, in the entire works of Shakespeare or, you, or uh, where, where are the times that, uh, how many times did Plato uh, refer to uh, friendship or something like this. Uh, and then you can, uh, and, and that's actually can be very handy. Uh, but uh, uh, but um, what it tends to do is to produce um, more extensive works that are less deep. You know, you've got more to discuss, 
uh, but you don't necessarily have uh, anything deeper to discuss. Um, there's a big push towards this. There seems to be a lot of money for it, precisely because it seems to require a lot of uh, techie, computer techie type people um, to help uh, people like me who don't want anything to do with it. Um, so that, I think, is really uninteresting uh, theoretically and politically, um, but it's, um, it's the major thrust of the whole thing. And it goes with, along with the general ideology that um, more technology, the better, and all of that kind of stuff. So uh, I, and that's not uh, the way to go. On the other hand, uh, did the internet, digitization, all of that is a phenomenon of our time. And it is changing a lot of the practical things we do. And if it's our job to understand uh, the way uh, we are human, and the practical things through which we 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 can we, we affirm that to ourselves, um, we need to think about this. Now, uh, um, it turns out that it's a lot harder to get support to think about it in this way uh, than it is to you know digitize some works or something like that. But I do think that so so again you see, you see this is a field which which has got all sorts of tension in it. Um, and um, if, if a person is really smart, they might be able to get some research money under the first heading and use it for the second. Um, I, would, I would recommend that as a strategy uh, um, because for the second, you have to find people who really understand, you know, a few other co co academics or, or, or critics who have a similar background to yourself would understand the point of that. Um, uh, so, it's it's an entry into 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 um, interesting work potentially. I think. Thanks. Other um, responses to either the digital technology or class divides, growing disparities um, between groups. The panel. Well, the, the class divide is uh, it's that's what we were talking about before, right? The the transformation of the of university is is more acute in uh, in the states. Uh, is the role of the st of the state also that it's also important? And when we uh, in the, in, uh, in in Canada, when we cut the funding of university and you need money to survive, of course people are going to look for money where it is and they take it wherever it is. The problem, of course, is that we have to deal with this. Um, Techni technically, it's great. It sounds great to have uh, all kinds of, uh, of art gallery, museums, and even classrooms with the name of a, a donor and so on. So then we enter into this tra the tra American tradition of uh, uh, it's, not, it's not a right, but it's like, you know, what do you call it when you give some, something to somebody? Uh, uh, charity. It's charity. Charity, for me, is not very interesting. Rights is very interesting. It's important. So I prefer right than charity. But this is what we are entering into. And, and the, the issue at, it, at every university and each department is how do we deal with that type of thing? Because if we do not oppose the, um, what you say, sometimes it's you have to do certain things in order to have that money. And it's given to some parts of a department, not the entire department, to do a specific things, things like that. So that I would... Um, I always done that. I mean, I fight against this, but of course I lose. But uh, but I think it's the, it's the role because uh, also the um, is the, the technology is one thing, but it's, uh, it's technology is only to to do something with it. And so what I'm more interested in is that, as you mentioned before, is uh, the issues that are defined and uh, and 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 we are we should be able to discuss freely. And that's why I think the university is not over. It might be in ruins, but it's not over because it's a, it's a space that uh, allow still some discussion, some disagreement, some... And also it depends, we didn't mention this, but, you know, talking about the dean's office, it depends also... But this, this is very important, though, because it depends who runs it. Sometimes you have some very interesting people who, who understand all that we're talking about, and they and they produce some very good product, right? Uh, some others, as we have we had in the past, some examples at uh, a total disaster, but not for university, right? But for us, disaster. So uh, 
once you are aware of this, and I think uh, the alternative, it's, it's, it can be, it's there. I mean, I use that, the alternative as well, right? I mean, I do also work outside university and in different countries and so on. But I think it is, it is important to kind of, to, to say that it's still a space where we can do a lot a lot of things, a lot of thinking, a lot of transform, transforming with students and so on. I mean, it's a fantastic atmosphere. So, but we have to, we have to f shape it, knowing all the difficulties that you're, you're mentioning. Thank you. Um, Antonio, you had a comment. <clears throat> well, I want to, to bring two to, to moments, I think, that are uh, important in relationship with the university, or mostly in the American university. Uh, one is the 68, 68, early 70s, where the revolt and the rights of the students that are joining other rights for workers and other uh, people in revolt. And the 84, that I think in the United States is important because the, the Reagan administration is where they increase the privatization of the university and where appears the word fundraising, when the universities they start to need to look for the money and the departments they start to look for the money. I think this moment uh, in a university like MIT, for example, that is what I know, uh, make to collapse some departments that are more based on research because the inability to fundraising for some people in this department. And the race of other departments where some corporate uh, people being introduced to the university are kind of uh, leader this department. And you see examples clear, the Media Lab in MIT is a department that appears in 84 uh, Nicolas Negroponte uh, has the ability to for farm raising and join with the other forces in MIT, the military and the Department of Defense, and obviously money coming from Japan or from Korea. And this makes a situation where the research starts to be very, 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 very contradictory because most of the people are working there, students coming found, uh, with a grant from Korea or from other parts of the world, they don't know what the part of the, the chain are in a fragment. And maybe the research is going to be part of the military, not maybe, sure. That, that the contradiction on what you say in terms of the technological part I think it has to do with uh, a lot with the, the word fundraising yeah. in the private sector or sectors that they could see the research in apply word. And you know when you see research in application, immediate application is questioning the idea of the research. I think the research sometimes not necessarily needs to have an immediate application. The media lab is immediate. I mean, no no project is being there if it's not have an appli immediate application. That I think a little bit in relation to what you were saying. Thank you. And um, SFU has SEAT and expanding regions where there's um, a lot of technological expansion. So I think we have some work to do at SFU to figure out what's happening. <laughs> uh, I, there are three questions. There's uh, Professor Jerry Zaslov. And then the gentleman here and another gentleman there. So, uh, Jerry. Uh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> for, for someone like me who's been around from zero, zero hour, um, 1965, <clears throat> and Simon Fraser, um, I was interested in the idea that there are turning points in the installation. You quote tur the turning points. And listening to Serge, it's, I'm interested in where, what you think were the turning points. Um, you could, I could even paraphrase Serge's uh, book, uh, how, how the university stole the idea of academy 
of the of the academic. Um, right on. In this, <laughs> the, the idea that that uh, there are turning points that one could recognize historically seems to me very important uh, to talk about. The, the speed of change is, is, and the, the scope of change, as you've just pointed out, is the, is the dominant hegemonic reality that academics don't count, really, in, in terms of the centralizing and monopolizing of the financial uh, spirit, if you like, the, 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 the geist, the spirit of change, which has happened pretty much in the 1980s in Vancouver, uh, when there was a, an important transformation of the funding of, uh, of universities. In, in. Now, having made that point around the, the deinstitutionalization of academia, uh, one could, but the academic, as Ian has pointed out, and maybe you could address this, is, is, is a spiritual vocation or a cultural or a creative, critical vocation of the, of the individual, uh, intellectual. So what seems to me interesting about this particular <clears throat> uh, intervention of Antonio's is that there is a contradiction between the university and the, acad and the academic. Uh, there's a deep uh, um, contradiction. When you deinstitutionalize the academic, the academic has no place to go except to back into the um, institution for protection and preservation of its academic values. There's no place to go in the public uh, sphere. So maybe you, this is a comment rather than a, uh, 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 a direct uh, uh, observation to what anyone has said. It's a, it's a comment about, uh, for example, Chomsky, um, Chomsky in 1963 had already written American Power and the New Mandarins, you know, and Paul Goodman even wrote a book that talked about a, bo a school as a box with the seats facing forward, uh, like, you're look like we're looking at here. So the critique of higher education began a long, long time before this zero hour of the 19s, uh, as you pointed out, between the 1968 and the 1980s at, at, uh, in this particular location. So that's just a comment, Kirsten, and thank you. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much, Jerry. Um, does anyone have a response? Well, not a okay. response, but not oh. a response, but maybe uh, like the uh, my experience with the, uh, the the French institution, like you don't have a really a, a, a year zero, but you can see a, attempt, for example, under Giscard already, Giscard d'Estaing, the French president, he's the one who uh, wanted to cut something because it's, we always have problems with money, and the, the two departments he wanted to cut in the French university was philosophy and uh, religious studies, the two base of French culture, in a sense, right? He tried to do that, and, uh, and then you have an eruption. I mean, people were not agreeing. Like, it was like a very uh, tense uh, moment for several months. People fought back, and so we still have philosophy and religious studies now. And, uh, but you know, that's, that was a moment then the, the public understood that something was at stake here, and, and very, very dangerous if we start doing this. I mean, but it was more money for law schools and for uh, business and so on. And, and we arrive at this uh, image that I saw with surprise also. I, I mean, the way I talk, I'm, you, you find that, or you think that I'm always surprised about this. Not really, but uh, <laughs> it was kind of shocking to see, to visit the campus of San Diego, for example, in the early 90s. And a, a, a scholar uh, told me to come with him and to visit the Department of Economics, and it was uh, before it was called the Economic Department. And now it was called, with a big sign, it was called Bank of America Department of Economics. So that, and the, nobody is ashamed of doing this. That's what I'm surprised sometimes. Yeah. Say, what? <laughs> so there's interesting things going around on, especially with regard to the affective investment and subjectivity. Um, I think especially uh, the work that feminist and um, Aboriginal scholars are doing around subjectivity that really bring those to the fore in terms of the types of investments and why populations can't shift or academics can't shift. But we do have a question here, I believe. Um, hi. Um, my name is Trevor Bodie. I'm an architectural critic and urbanist. Um, I'd like to go back to Mantaras Defi in bringing a, a work that he prepared in Boston and New York here and asking us through Sabina what is uh, different about Vancouver situation or, or how would things power uh, roll out differently in Vancouver academe. Um, and I think there's one term that's really missing in the debate so far. And it's not so much that 
gender and class and racial and corporatist analyses are wrong. But the particular operative fact in this city is the unusual and hugely distorted role that real estate plays in every aspect of the city. Uh, maybe, Sarah, at one time, the endowment lands or Burnaby Mountain served as a firewall from the kind of real estate ethos which founded the city with a land deal with the CPR and which has structured it at every stage and has made the world's second most expensive city. Uh, maybe the universities resisted that at one point, but that's long gone. Uh, our universities are hugely into the real estate game. Uh, they've come to rely on real estate dollars for bare operational, functional health. Um, uh, at UBC, Montadas, if you went out there, every uh, front lawn, every parking lot, every little piece of land has long been given away to developers who then made the money on it, the land lift, the increased value. Um, if the regents of UBC ran Harvard, Harvard Yard would long ago have had a tower, a podium, and a few bungalows on it. Uh, no, a, a level of intensification and privatization of the spaces of our campuses is, is unheard of in any American university. So I'm just wondering if real estate is the master narrative of this city, and I really believe it is, more than anything else. It is the single lens through which you can understand almost anything in Vancouver. I just wonder if any of the panelists would like to, if you want, slightly shift their analyses uh, back uh, and, and talk about real estate as a factor. So we have a request from the floor. <laughs> uh, if we say yes, so that's no, end, no, end of the no. discussion. You know, no, no. Let's get some analysis there, on here. There is one difference, it seems to me. Uh, I, I think you're on to something there. And, and, and one of the differences between the situation in the U.S. and the situation here, which I think everybody knows about, is, that, is the difference with private universities. And if, it seems that the private elite universities did form the basis from which you started, uh, Anthony. So uh, they play a different role in the system, and they, they, they produce graduates who go to very powerful places and make huge amounts of money, and that, that goes into their endowment and so that they don't have to pave over Harvard Yard. Um, whereas here, there's, our graduates are not, uh, on the whole, uh, going to do that for us. In fact, that was not what they were designed, we were designed to do. We were supposed <laughs> to teach the population here in BC, and we have something to do with public education across the board. However, that's uh, history. We can't make because we're paying too much in real estate. <laughs> but I must say, I, I, I mean, I agree with you absolutely. That, I mean, the, the defense of UBC Farm was well fought, but, you know, some, yeah, it saved in its little... Uh, to some extent, but I, I am not a big one for singular analysis myself. I do think at UBC, the international students is where the pot is right now the, of, of money that they have their eye on it. But certainly, the, you're right, the University Endowment at Manhattan has been a very significant source of, of revenue, but I think there's something else new you need to add to your analysis along with the real estate. Well, I'll just put that for a second. The next campus buildings will be paid for by rental accommodation which are priced only for an international market. Absolutely. In other words, they need international students to pay the inflated rents to build the buildings which will pay, pay for the next wave of faculty buildings. So in other words, the internationalization of the student body is driven by real estate. I don't yeah, know. or there's, a, there's an intersection of flows, <laughs> global flows in real estate, which are very interesting, especially in the space here as a colonial space. Um, on this particular land. So, um, yeah, I think there's layers of analysis there at play. I don't, I, don't think, like, I don't think that you can understand even your analysis without placing it within the context of settler colonial dispossession. So I think, and that you can't separate it or, or render uh, uh, prior to questions of, of race and, and these issues. So I would still stand by, by colonial analysis of these issues. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. And the the, dis, the um, reconfigurations of the city and and uh, and the transformations around um, Aboriginal movements and successful claims as well. Um, it'll be really interesting in the future to see where that where that takes us. Um, as real estate plays itself out with those global flows. <laughs> so uh, there was a question here. 
our point here. Hi there. Um, I think it's actually oh. sort of funny that we're... Please, please introduce yourself. Yes. Please. No, in fact, I'm going to do that. Okay. Um, so I just want to... I was having a discussion with my partner who's had to leave, but we were noting kind of different oversights or things that we saw about the panel. She's a scientist, and she said, oh, there's no scientist on this panel. And so I wanted to perhaps ask the panel to speculate about how science, maybe we assume, assume that science is being done in the same way as all of you humanities people. And since I'm supposed to introduce myself, I happen to be a sessional teaching both at an American university here in Vancouver and at SFU. And there hasn't been much discussion about sessionals. So I am obviously, in introducing myself, I am a product, basically, of the modern university. And contemplating the fact that my life, might, I might be a sessional forever. Um, and once upon a time, session, being a sessional was a kind of a part-time bridge on the way to being a tenure-track faculty member. And I'm not probably going to have that chance. And so I just thought that we might bring that in as well. Excellent. Um, so are you teaching in science? Is no, that I'm, your... I, I, I teach English, but, I'm, oh, okay. but, but I have a partner who's a scientist okay. and who was sort of noting that there are no scientists on this panel. Yes, that would be a very interesting iteration uh, to do this panel around, you know, bringing in science. I, uh, panelists, thoughts on science and not just the uh, applied science, but, you know, there's a huge variety of different types of science at well, play. And, and then we also have sessional and uh, the labor force. Let me just give a, say a couple of quick words about science because I, I do think it's an interesting case and, and, and I think that the, the trouble is that it, uh, the corporatization process happened with sciences way, way before it happened with the arts and humanities. So I think that you would have to go back in time to see people being concerned about it. The, post, the people that I've met are post, basically saying, well, this is just reality and it has been ever since I got here. Uh, if you look at a book called Academic Matters, which uh, uh, Claire Polster and uh, Janice Newman, I think it was, edited recently, which has got talk, uh, a lot of people talking about their life in academia and the problems that they, they feel are there now. You, the scientists, um, they, they, don't, they don't really talk about this. They talk about other things because this is just the world they swim in. I think that's the reason. Um, there are, of course, we have you know, a number of, of outstanding scientists who've stepped beyond that. But, uh, but I think there are, there are very few fish in the sea there. Well, in terms of sessionals, uh, um, as I, uh, in my introductory remarks, I noted there's a, a weird thing happening at UBC where, um, and partly it was the union that, that made this move, but the university is fully committed to um, reducing the sessional labor force and making a more permanent kind of 12-month um, lecture or uh, five-month, even like extending the 12-month to a five, not five, month, five year kind of contract. So. There's this kind of weird uh, against swimming against the trend towards flexibilization at UBC um, with a, a returning sessionals to being um, uh, uh, well tied to, to PhD professionalization. So the uh, understanding is that PhD students should have an opportunity to teach at least once or twice as a sessional and uh, to uh, you know, um, uh, study the replacement. So I don't... I, 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 I'm not quite sure what's going on, why that's happening, because it's expensive. So I'm going to stand up, because there's a bias happening here. I'm sitting, so I only see the front section. So there might be questions in the back. Yes, please introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Kate. Um, I work in the neighborhood, like a couple blocks from here. And uh, basically, on a daily basis, I'll walk under that Stan Douglas uh, photo in the atrium, and I was just curious to hear your your guys' thoughts on the artwork and its placement here, and uh, what that means. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, yeah, I'm I'm very interested in that piece myself, and uh, so um, I said a few things about it. Um, I usually don't write about artworks, like contemporary artworks, because that's always uh, difficult because once you get into this, you become an art critic, and I'm kind of against them. 
So I don't do that usually. But in this particular case, because it is a, it's in a public place and articulate a very interesting series of issues for Vancouver, but not only for Vancouver, for the, the, the issue that we were just all discussing here, um, I, I kind of, yeah, I looked at it kind of carefully about it. And uh, what is interesting is that it's about the memory of, memory of the city and uh, th something that happens in the 1970s uh, has an, an incredible echo today still. So you don't talk about, uh, you know, like, yeah, 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 today is terrible, this kind of thing. You don't do that, but you say, listen, nothing much has changed from what's happening, what was happening in the seven, in seventy one, and you you he creates it like a um, something that is very uh, attractive, but at the same time uh, extremely demanding because you have to kind of uh, w look at it, you have to look kind of you know seriously, and after a while you don't you never forget. So the idea is when you walk through the street and you watch that that, that piece, once you go you walk to your everyday kind of thing, it seems to me that you walk, or you walk away like those, those cartoons with those little things like this, you know, like you never forget it. So you walk around in the street and you see all those people with a little bl blurb, you know, kind of uh, with part of the image that, that really talk to you. In a, and he talks about politics, he talks about sites, he talks about, uh, about the uh, gentrification, I mean, completely, right? Um, it talks about Hollywood. It talks about photography, of course, but uh, but it's also mainly about politics and drugs as well, and police, the the the, the violence of the police as well. So it's a, it's a kind of um, a return, but a return to the present again, right? So that's why I think it's quite interesting piece. I think the subtext of that work is that uh, the university should stop trying to raise money through uh, selling condos and getting in international students and should get into the dope business, which is where the money really is. <laughs> okay. Uh, <no. laughs> okay. Um, Anthony, ha you, you had a comment. Well, I've, I feel like the, it's difficult always the position of the artist in relationship with the public space and the, how it could be intervened in the public uh, with her work and how the work it could be integrated in a way that function in a community, function in the city, etc. I think observing the work, I feel like, uh, than, uh, and I don't know much about the work and the, enough about the area where it's located, but I think it kind of divides between private and public space because one is a part what I hear that is part of this office and organization that becomes privatized. And the other side is the place where it's much public and is not close at night. Like that, it has a division and the versus and retro image that signalize and divide this kind of private and public space. I don't know how much uh, Stan Douglas he was aware of that. I'm sure he is, because I think he's a very thoughtful person. But in a way, seeing the work, I think he has a kind of border there. Then the image, then obviously what Serge mentioned, and the, the way how the image is configured. He talks about many of the situation, but I think it was interesting. Is like he brings a little bit of the struggle of the building in relationship with the neighborhood too. I think maybe not. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, so I think there's a really interesting discussion, investigation of art, and uh, reimagining and, and breaking up boundaries in, in public spaces that's at play here. There's a question um, here uh, with the gentleman. Uh, oh, so, oh, sorry. Sorry, we have to go. Um, I yes. I oh, 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 no, oh, not quite. Not, not quite yet. We, I have you on my list. Oh, yes, right. In the line of Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so my name is Oliver. Uh, I'm a filmmaker. Uh, I just wanted to uh, uh, comment and, and, uh, and question uh, uh, about the makeup of the panel as well, because um, 
Uh, for me, um, recently I read that aesthetics, the, the, the prehistory of uh, the word aesthetic, uh, comes from um, the idea of improving upon reality. And uh, for me, that's what the university is about, is to improve upon what is possible, uh, to question always. So um, when, when I see this, when I come here, and, and I, 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 I only hear from... Uh, people from the humanities, I'm quite kind of depressed because I, I do think that there is, you know, people within other areas that should be interested in such public discourse, in the whole idea of public discourse, as the be as the reason for their for their for their paycheck, if you will. And um, uh, so, uh, you know, my question, I guess, is to you, is to is to know whether or not this is really the case here in 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 uh, uh, Vancouver. That that uh, it is so isolated that the that the different discourses are so isolated from one another that there is no dialogue between uh, uh, the complex sciences and uh, the discourses of uh, the humanities. Well, I don't want to, to answer. I think maybe Sabine could answer that the specifically. But what I wanted to say then, in the same way that about academia is specific about United States, I always think that it will be other parts. And I think, hearing all the things, I think it should be other parts of these debates. For example, it will be not only about the science, not only about, what about the students? Why not all the students are sitting here? I think it's a, this is a very important part of the, of the university. And I think this is something that should be a debate, another part of these debates where the students they could say what they have to say. Uh, that's kind of shocking to me. I just want to say I'm a geographer. I'm part of a geography department that there's physical scientists, um, you know, geomorphologists, climatologists. So the idea of t in being in dialogue with scientists is just part of what I breathe. Um, so, you know, so I'm a, I'm a, a, a geographer who, who wrote a play, right? So I think those, I actually think there's all sorts of Crossovers, interesting crossovers, and conversations that do happen, and, and whether they've happened on this panel. Yeah, I, I'm just suggesting that those crossovers are probably the only vehicle for increasing knowledge. It's only in those spaces, in those in the spaces between disciplines, I think, that the possibility of new knowledge can be developed. And uh, unfortunately, because otherwise it just circles around itself, and it just becomes a rhetorical stream. And that rhetorical stream becomes very boring for other people, uh, you know, because it needs to be uh, dynamic and informed by, by numerous other voices. I think one of the things at play here, and we do have social scientists and people from the humanities, one of the things at play here is actually, while we all critique and discuss the universities, actually even making a public forum to begin that. And so what you're asking for, and I think a couple of people have mentioned this, is a call for the expansion of this iteration. And I think that's very important to do. So one of the elements of being an academic is actually isolation and um, fragmentation. And actually, like, um, Antonio, you're talking about how we're all rushing around saying, we're, we're coming from teaching, we're coming from teaching, we're coming from meetings and, and all of this administration. So the very types of works we do, we don't have a lot of time to squeeze out to do this type of work. So this, this is an iteration, and there's a call, and I think it's an interesting call, to engage um, people, say, from biology or chemistry. Um, that said, there are different ways in which each of the disciplines have been colonized in different ways. So the discussions we have been having with you know, people in different units, it is quite interesting. It would be interesting to bring that into, up, into, into play. Um, so I think that's been heard. Uh, 
so being oh, no, that's fine. So yeah, we appreciate that comment very much. Uh, that's a great, great step we can take. Uh, I believe um, I'm in the back. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh yeah. Here and then here. Uh, thanks. I, I just had a, a, a couple of uh, uh, comments. Uh, my name is uh, Am Joe Hall, and I I work in community engagement uh, out of this out of this building, and uh, I've been here for about a, two years or so, and uh, it's uh, been really hard. <laughs> and sorry to be more more specific, it's been really fucking hard. <laughs> uh, um, the uh, I think some of the, the the challenges and the contradictions of the university uh, itself, um, you know, watched over a long period of time. From the time when I was a student, uh, and my first job at a university was working in fundraising at UBC, managing the phone room, making fourteen bucks an hour, and having most of the staff be international students making minimum wage, and seeing the kind of complications of of that. And uh, in terms of a, of, a, of a building like this, I think the, the comments that, that Ian was making, I think, are really important about trying to maintain uh, those spaces of academic integrity and public conversation and those parts of the university that are really important and critical to maintain a kind of publicness. And even though there has been private money come into this building, uh, there's been over $50 million of public money that's gone into this building. And that's a really important principle to maintain about are those firewalls in place to allow those things to happen? And were it not for uh, the problematic politics of this building, of this space, and all of the issues that people have talked about, uh, in some sense, this space for at least a period of time and, and, and where many people, faculty, staff, other people, are fighting to kind of maintain a space of a public conversation. And uh, additionally to that, even when a, a, a public building like this comes to be physically, you know, the first year that this uh, building was open, the front doors on the Hastings Street side were closed to the public. So there's a whole level of apparatuses beyond the private that are even within the institution itself that reflect uh, I think in a very problematic way about how open uh, an, an, an institution um, actually is. And I think that those, and where people have chosen, you know, I have many, many friends of mine who uh, boycotted this building, for example, or, uh, or sometimes people have booked the space to have those really critical conversations about mining in Canada, and I respect the way people kind of orient and, and navigate those, those politics, but it's when people even evacuate those spaces to go somewhere else those, to have those conversations, they'll go to Harbor Center to be at the Fletcher Challenge Theater, or they'll go to the Carnegie Center. And so no matter how we uh, navigate these places, they're purely prog problematic, and we're all in these spaces of trying to figure out what the right thing, is, thing to do is. And uh, for many of us, you know, we, we don't have uh, tenure as faculty members to speak out in quite the same way. And so I think uh, of how to maintain a, rep a repetition and a perpetuation of this notion of what publicness is, is essentially what's at stake and has to be kept as part of the conversation. Thanks. Um, uh, the gentleman in the front here, uh, in the... Second from, yeah, second, yeah, here we are. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Ali. I think my question uh, is somehow a continuation of Am's question. Uh, having heard all this conversation about what has happened to university or university wants to do this, university is going to do that, uh, it makes me, makes me feeling about that university is something external to to, to at least people sitting in this panel, and you know it's a it's an external phenomenon sitting somewhere, or and there is a a invisible apparatus behind it. However, that's true as well. Uh, but when I'm looking at the catalog and I look at at the themes that Antonio is mentioning in the catalog, uh, I think we're all familiar with you know university versus academia, institution versus corporation. And I don't see anything special that has happened to university and ha has not happened to anything else in our, in our era. Our sandwiches are not having the quality that had, you know, you know, I don't know, 
15 years ago, our cards, everything, everything, everything has been changed and university is not an exemption to that. But a word that makes me so curious in between days is the space and makes me thinking about where is this space of knowledge or in those two moments that uh, Antonio was mentioning, like 68 and 84, that like sparkling moments that, and uh, taking words of David Harvey because you have it in, in, in the interviews, like about the space as keywords that we have absolute spaces and relative and eventually relational spaces. Uh, I think what has happened to academia or university is the, you know, is the, is the laws and lack of you know, relationality to, to the public. And that sessional uh, suffering situations is, is, is part of that, that our tenures are, I mean the, ten, the tenure position instead of be, becoming something to give the security and the immunity to, to, to the faculty to keep re researching is just a stopping point. So you're immune to, to don't do anything more. So uh, why are, ten, uh, or from dean of, you know, or dean office, you know, I've never heard that the dean office went on a strike because of that thing or because of this complaint because or... I booted or, out of my union, I can't go on strike. Pardon me? <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. I'm still resentful that I was booted out of the union, I can't go on strike. No, no, I, I take it or, or something like that. <laughs> you know, we, we, never, we never have a call to public that, hey, yeah, this is, you know, the, 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 the real estate and, you know, the con condo making, UBIS is doing this, is doing that, you know. Giving a call for public, you know, to go and participate. I, I, I don't see anything special, you know, specific about, you know, uh, the symptoms that are you know undergoing toward university and is not undergoing you know toward anything else and I, I just I just don't see any relationality between the space of knowledge and and the very body of the body of the society. Uh, so. Hey, well, I um, I don't know if anyone wants to address that because we have one more question after this, but then we're going to have to wrap up. Um, or two short ones and then one short. But did anyone want to address uh, this gentleman's comments I'd, here? I'd like to say something. I'd try and keep it real short. But okay. uh, um, this relates to what Jerry Zaslov was bringing up earlier as well. And, and the, if we just say 68 as kind of indicating a whole bunch of stuff quickly. Um, there were critic, critics of the university predating that by a long way. But I think what happened is that you had both the critics of the university overlapping with a, a, a widely shared feeling that was critical of the society as a whole. And this is, I think, the, the, the issue you're on to. And it was basically, again, to say it all very quickly, the Vietnam War. So, and the militarization of universities, the Canadian complicity in the, Amer uh, in the Vietnam War, the, the, the making of arms, uh, the, large, the only thing that I know that came close to that later was in the 1980s was the, uh, the cruise missile. So, this is partly why I was talking about the resource sector and, 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 and mining and that kind of stuff, because I think that what you're looking for it only happens when there is a generally widely felt social concern. It, it only happens in universities, right? When there is both a, a widely shared social concern that overlaps with the critics of the university. So otherwise, we're critics of the university, but we also have to defend the university because we think there's a lot of good about it as well, and we're caught back in this back and forth. And it's, it's valid. It's, it's, you know, that's where I am. But, uh, but it becomes socially important and, and goes wider when there's something structural that is bugging lots of people. And uh, who knows when that's going to really take on, come, come on. Things are very diffuse now. There are lots of really important things. There's Aboriginal sovereignty and the relationship to the, government, to the, to the nation state. It's a very, very deep-rooted, important thing, and I, I absolutely agree with what Glenn had to say about that. But, and then there's also the, you know, how, how does it galvanize? I think, I don't know. I wish I did. <laughs> yeah. So we, we definitely don't want to become sandwiches, um, starting, as you mentioned, in, in, the, in the beginning of your discussion. <laughs> yeah. 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 So this is the distinction we're all trying to avoid. <laughs> um, so there was someone in the very back, but I'm not sure if uh, that person is still there. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And then... This will Hi. be the... Uh, my name is Nicholas Perrin. I'm a grad student here. Just a couple of quick comments, I guess. Um, one of them being, when you talk about corporatization of the uni university, and just that is a process, it's sort of a messy metaphor, because I think the university 
it's structuring itself like a bad corporation, a corporation in the 80s in terms of management models and uh, centralization and everything. And so that's, for people who do managerial studies, that's, that's something to think through in terms of describing the culture of the university. It's not um, as flexible at all as a contemporary corporate environment would be. And um, <laughs> the other thing would be just something to think about in terms of the building and what Am and Trevor were saying. Uh, I was involved in some of the organizing uh, pushback against Gold Corps when uh, it was first announced that the school was going to be named after it and the, uh, the money came from them. And th we begin to kind of understand what it meant for a university to be built um, in a partnership with, with private corporations and development and everything. This, the space that we're in. Uh, the foyer, the courtyards, the atrium where the Stan Douglas photo is, it, it's like qualitatively different than uh, other university spaces because it's not open to student use at all. Uh, you can't have clubs set up outside. You can't have a political rally out there. It's actually illegal. And so just in terms of the way that the university itself, and this, I believe this is true of Robson Square as well, and so just, just something to tie a couple of the comments together, I guess. Thank you very much. Well, in fact, UBC is not a public space. I mean, that's that. I mean, it's not just this space. When the TA uh, TAs went on strike, one of the moves that the university wanted to try to make was to, um, you know, stop the capacity to strike because, and by declaring it's not a public space. So, so, so yeah. The, I, the whole debate around public space in the university is a really uh, complicated one. But this is more, you know, it's more obvious here at least. At UBC, people just, you know, you just, you think it's a public space. It's not. Thanks. So, um, Antonio is going to make the final comment and then no, we'll bring it to... it's not final. Oh, all right. <laughs> never final. It's never final. Not okay. final. Not final. <laughs> it's a comment about public space. I think that we leave... Uh, Mm, a situation where public space is disappearing and it's less and less public space by privatization and because uh, the ways how surveillance control uh, function like that. I don't think, uh, I think we are losing public space, not only here, I think in all parts of the world. I think if one thing it was interesting, the things happen in Europe in this uh, Egypt and uh, is the, the recovering of public space, the, the square, the plaza, the agora, all the manifestation of indignados in Madrid and all the, the, the situation, it was in the public space. And besides the politics was uh, happening, the fact that everything happened in the street, that it was a recovering on the public space, I think it was very important. Because I think we live in a moment where uh, private sector occupy the public space and all the systems of the control, surveillance. I mean, we are under two uh, situations where they make the public space is disappearing. Okay. So, um, thank you. Yes. Um, Just one yes. comment. Um, I think it's important, and this gets back at the, the real estate um, perspective. I think it's also important to, uh, we cannot speak about public spaces, common spaces or whatever in a decontextualized, a historical way, because you could conceivably fix a public space or real estate issue through uh, state regulation or through various like reclamation sort of projects, which would um, continue the originary violence that structures the present um, of the original enclosure of, uh, of indigenous peoples and dispossession. So to think of public spaces and to think of these kind of the strategies, the alternatives, the, the anti-gentrification kind of struggles for comments has to be placed in that context or else you're just, you're part of the problem. So these things have to be navigated with that originary ongoing uh, dispossession enclosure um, in mind or else, or else we're, just, we're just replicating it in the present. So we have to continue to challenge the structures of our strategies of resistance and, and open them up, especially around territory, land, um, and violence. So I'd like to thank the panelists. So first of all, I'd like to thank very much um, Antoni um, Montadas for making this possible, bringing us together. 
uh, bringing everyone together and for his fantastic work. Um, I'd like to thank Sabine and uh, her crew for making this possible. And I'd like, okay. <laughs> the panelists and everyone in the audience who came, the people who participated in the discussion, thank you very much. And I'm suspecting there's going to be uh, more iterations uh, given the calls from the floor. So we, we thank you all for that.